Sure. I don't um, know. Off, um, uh, dehydrating, essentially. All right, this is episode 18 of Farm to Markets, and today we are talking about the proposed wealth tax, 3D printed homes, dehydrating food versus freeze drying food, and make sure to stick around to the end of this episode for the lightning round. Democrats have proposed a plan to tax the unrealized capital gains of Americans of America's wealthiest citizens as a way to help pay for their expensive legislation. Currently, gains on assets like stocks are only taxed when they are sold. However, the, the new uh, the proposed bill would tax uh, unsold assets before they're sold. So the way it currently works, if you hold shares of Coca-Cola and you let's say you buy it for $1,000 and then you make uh, $4,000 on it, so you have a total of $5,000, you sell that, that $4,000 would be taxed at the time of sale. Now what they're trying to do, what they're proposing to do is that they want to tax that $4,000 before it's sold. So if you make, if your $1,000 of uh, Coca-Cola goes to $5,000 in a year, every year they want to tax that before it's sold. Uh, do you think this is a, excuse me, do you, and so what do you think, how successful do you think this will be? I, I don't think it's going to be wildly successful. Um, it, it seems that people that are in favor of this have an almost cartoonish image of wealthy people. It's, it's like they have these stockpiles of cash and, uh, and they're swimming around in it like Scrooge McDuck. Uh, the reality is that most wealth isn't held in cash, but other assets like real estate, business holdings, shares of stocks. And in order to pay this annual wealth tax, these individuals would have to be, would have, would, would force to be, um, uh, would be forced to sell assets to come up with this cash. Large sales like this would probably put downward pressure on prices, which is not good for an expanding economy. It also seems that uh, people in favor of this have forgotten the old saying, don't bite the hand that feeds you. I'm not saying that the uber wealthy are our masters, but they are the people, um, but, but the people that would end up paying this wealth tax are the people that create jobs, they create products, they develop technology, they donate large sums to, uh, to worthy causes. And just like the other 99.95%, they have balance sheets too. And if their financial liabilities increase, we'll have to cut costs somewhere else. I think the only people that will truly have a net benefit from this, uh, if it becomes a law, is a small handful of lawyers and accountants that specialize in representing the uber wealthy. Um, a lot of laws that come out of Congress uh, tend to make Swiss cheese look solid, and I don't think that this law would be any exception. And if it actually does come to that, I think we'll see a lot of billionaires just pack up and leave. And th that's my thoughts on it. Yeah, well, I... I... <laughs> I think Drew pretty much nailed it. Um, this, to me, sounds like a, just a terrible idea in general. Uh, I think the biggest, the biggest thing you'll just see out of this is a lot of assets get offshored out of the reach of the government. Um, it's, it's, it's really difficult to see how this works any, anywhere else besides on paper. And I honestly think that's the only thing it's supposed to really do. It's not supposed to actually raise revenue. It's supposed to do it on paper so that the Senate parliamentarian can rubber stamp it as reconciliation friendly so that it can pass their huge spending bill without a single Republican. Uh, I think really that's the only intention of this. I can't see how it'd be workable. You know, would it just be stocks? How about homes? Um, really, uh, to me, it just looks looks completely unworkable. I I can't understand why anybody would even support such an idea, but apparently, some people are. I'm going to go on a limb here, and I'm going to make a prediction that no billionaire anywhere is going to pay one dime in wealth taxes. This has got to be the most ridiculous idea of legislation that we've seen in my lifetime. It is unconstitutional. It is economically unworkable. And it just doesn't make sense beyond the, the political expediency level. It certainly does drip velvetly off the tongue if your constituency feels better every time a billionaire somewhere somehow has to pay more in taxes. But to Alex's point, it's not going to raise any revenue. Anybody with a sixth grade education is going to figure out how to avoid this tax and, uh, and is not going to pay it. Uh, unless the federal government allows people to pay money in stock 
or real estate or ownership in, in shares of companies, who's going to buy those, those holdings in order to come up with the cash because the IRS only takes cash. So if Jeff Bezos has to pay 10 or $12 billion in taxes to, to meet this particular wealth tax, he's going to depress the stock values for everybody else because he's selling a bunch of shares in an inefficient way. Um, there are just way too many billionaire Democrats who are going to put up with this nonsense. And so, yeah, they might scream from mountaintops uh, how they're going to soak the rich, but Congress will be whispering in, from wells to their constituents and their billionaire donors on how they can avoid this ridiculous idea. In uh, between uh, 2000 2012, France had a wealth tax, and they also had an estimated 42,000 millionaires uh, between 2000 and 2012 uh, leave the country. So, this, so that's how well it worked in, in France. And you know, in the 1990s, 12 European companies, excuse me, 12 European countries also had a wealth tax. And today that's, that's down to three. So the, the wealth tax clearly does not have a good track record. And I think Alex is right. I think this is just you know, this is just a paper game so that the, uh, yeah, so that they can stamp the, uh, the budget and be like, yep, we paid for it. Yeah, the, the democratic socialists uh, should take a lesson from Sweden and France and abolish the wealth tax right. or not have it in place in the first place. Well, the other thing is that the government's going to have to get real good at valuing art and homes and classic cars and, uh, mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff, because not, not everything's easy to value as like shares of Coca-Cola. Right. And so then, and basically what's going to happen is, is billionaires are going to be like, you know, the, the IRS is going to value a piece of art and then the, the billionaires are going to hire their lawyer to, uh, to dispute that. And then they're just going to tie up the, uh, the issue in court for years and, uh, and, and, and they'll never get their money out of it. So, so yeah. So, so again, like, like you guys said, and I know nobody's disagreeing here, but I, I don't see this, uh, this working out well. And like Alex said, I think it's just a game just so they can, uh, they can call the budget uh, reconciled. The concept of 3D printed homes has been around for a while, and some believe this will be the way of the future. Uh, do you think this is true, and would you want to buy one? I, I think it's true. I, I think the idea of 3D printed homes is, is really cool. Um, I think it's great that it's a, it might be an option for the future. Uh, if you want to have a traditional home with a wooden frames and a concrete uh, foundation, great. If you want a 3D printed home, that's great. Um, I'm always encouraged to hear about um, about things that are better or more efficient or less expensive than the previous versions. Uh, I think it's a sign that innovation continues to exist. I would certainly live in a 3D printed home. Um, from what I've seen is you get to basically design your house on like AutoCAD or something, and they uh, they roll up with the uh, the tracks and just print it in a matter of days or weeks. Um, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I like the idea too. Um, I think it's uh, definitely an interesting idea. It seems like the interest right now is because of a construction labor shortage. Um, as far as whether or not I think this is really going to happen in the real world in the near term, it's probably not. I mean, I'm not that old, but I can think back like 20 years and, you know, remember like brick laying robots that were going to put all the masons out of business or like robots that could frame traditional houses. And I mean, they exist. It's just that nobody uses them. I mean, if, if, if the construction industry continues to have labor shortage, um, you might see a lot more of those technologies, including the like the 3D printed homes that we're talking about now. Um, rise more in popularity. Um, for now, if if the labor shortage is temporary, I, I don't really expect anything other than the traditional homes to be the, the norm. Um, but still a pretty cool idea. Um, someday, one, whether it's five years from now or 50, whatever, these technologies will eventually be doing these jobs. So pretty cool ideas. Well, unlike last week's show, uh, today sounds more like the Mutual Agreement Society. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't have much more to add to what Drew and, and, and Alex have said about 3D houses. Uh, it looks like we're moving in, a, moving in the direction of higher efficiency and lower costs. And being the free marketeer that I am, I'm always in favor of both of those things. Uh, the ability to, to design your own house and, and, and be unique, uh, as well as be able to very efficiently, efficiently and inexpensively design an entire subdivision uh, by using 3D printing, uh, it just gives us more options. You know, people can always go the conventional option, 
But I think what we'll find is that over time, 3D printing will get so efficient, nobody's going to want to do the old conventional because it just doesn't make sense to do so. One hurdle is that the fact that concrete is not very environmentally friendly. And I saw a study from, uh, from Princeton University that said a pound of concrete creates 0.93 pounds of CO2 um, to create it. So you have some environmental issues if you're just going to print out of concrete. You green weenie butt, Tom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You, you guys just don't care about the environment like I do. Um, but no, but that's seriously, though, that, that, that's an issue is that you're going from wood houses which, I, you know, I, I'm not really sure what the environmental impact of like a, a typical wood house would be, but if you start creating a concrete house, apparently it's got some, uh, some, some environmental issues they got to contend with. You know, if they start drudging up like sand, dirt, and water from the location of the house, I, I imagine I see that going a lot better. But right now, you know, producing concrete creates a lot of CO2 for the air, so that's, that's going to be an issue for them. Also, I would live in a 3D printed house right after I sell my traditional house, the highest bidder, and then I only pay $50,000. And that's going to be the other big issue with 3D printed house. If you can create a house for four grand, uh, you know, with like five workers and you basically just AutoCAD your house, what's going to happen to the, the huge inventory of, of, uh, of U.S. homes that are currently standing? I mean, you're, you're looking at people taking, you know, multi that or, you know, $100,000 losses, you know, it's going to be more than that. I mean, like four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 losses on their gigantic homes that they have right now when they can now build one for 4,000. So, I mean, there's probably going to be some resistance to it. And then the second point is that you're probably going to end up, you know, even though you can produce a house cheaply, you're still buying land. So there's, there's some places in Whitefish where you can buy a, a thousand foot square house for like a five hundred thousand dollars and i guarantee you you're, you're not paying for the house on the land is that you're, you're basically going to bulldoze the house and you're paying you know four hundred fifty thousand dollars for a plot of land on whitefish and if you're in california it's, it's even worse so it, it, it you know it would it's probably going to help like alex said the uh, the labor shortage but as far as prices you know it's probably I, I, I wouldn't say that they'd get reduced that much, especially high in uh, high density areas, because you're still going to have to pay a pretty decent penny for uh, for pieces of land. Well, yeah, I, th I think personally that's the bigger issue with with housing today is not so much that there's a lack of materials or right now there's a labor shortage, but um, hopefully that's temporary. The the bigger problem is both you know in some places there's just not enough land for the amount of people that want to live there unless you build up. Uh, the other problem is there, there are some like states or local governments that make it extremely difficult to build a house. Or if you can build a house, you have to build it in very specific ways using specific materials or whatever. Um, so saving a little bit on labor, you know, if, if the entire industry adopted, you know, 3D printing of homes, uh, that you know that would be a cost savings in the short run, but it's still not going to make any more land in the Bay Area or in Whitefish, Montana, or anywhere else. So, um, like you were saying, Tom, I don't, I don't think, you know, that's gonna. I don't, I don't think labor is the biggest expense when building a house. It's usually land plus materials. So, um, still cool technology, but uh, in some places. What, what's really necessary to me is um, just let people build houses of any kind instead of not allowing them to build the houses. Thanks. Tom, to, to, your, to, your, to your point, Tom, where do you see the resistance for 3D printed homes coming from? Current homeowners? I mean, right. are they going to go through the legislative process and try to outlaw 3D printing? Good point. I, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know like, how you prevent that. I'm not really sure. I mean, I guess one way would be like, hey, it creates a lot of environmental issues because we don't like the concrete you're using. But but yeah, I mean, like, so, so what happens? So we get $4,000 houses and people who are living in million dollar houses who can now build their, their the same house for a fraction of the cost basically take a you know $900,000 um, loss. You know, <laughs> It, I mean, I, I can't see people being uh, thrilled about that, but at the same time, you know, what, what do you do about it? I, I don't know. You know, where's the resistance going to come from? My, my guess is the first thing would be environmental issues. And then secondly, like, like Alex said, you know, you'll probably get some pushback from, uh, 
um, in terms of uh, from like governments in terms of like zoning and uh, you know what kind of house they allow you to create and if they put a bunch of uh, you know ridiculous uh, what are they called like CNCs and like all the regulations that you have to like build the house that would drive up costs and then also you know and, and maybe the, the whole thing might be moot in the fact that you know it might be just more of a land issue than it might be a house issue so maybe instead of taking a nine hundred thousand dollar loss you just take a fifty thousand dollar loss because now you know the house you can build on top of the land is a little bit more is a uh, is less expensive but um but you still got to find the land though so well i've been seeing so, um this is not exactly the same but there's there have been a lot of uh governments and like homeowners associations and whatnot that have pushed back really hard against two other interesting um developments in the housing housing industries one is like shipping container homes i don't know if anybody's seen yep. those you just you know finish the inside of a shipping container or two or three of them and from the inside it just looks like a house uh and then tiny homes have been the other one you yep. know a 500 cool. square foot basically an efficiency home yeah um again you know those just get a ton of pushback i'm guessing a lot of governments won't like them because if the house isn't worth as much then it's not as much tax revenue um if they're ugly to look at you know that can depress values of nearby homes that are more attractive you know who wants to look at a pile of shipping containers um so you know, you you would probably if, if they can make them look nice i guess they don't really have that same issue but um, I think it would be a lot of the same same organizations or same people that oppose them as the other options. So no, that's a great point. I think like three years ago, I looked real hard at trying to build a tiny house against my wife's wishes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was going to put my her and myself and our two kids inside a tiny house. But the problem is I couldn't there was nowhere to park it. I couldn't get into any of the trailer parks because they were full and uh, you can't a house that small did not fit in any of the uh, the neighborhood uh, homeowners station uh, requirements. So yeah, it was, it, build a tiny house was, you know, you could do it, but you'd had to had to own some property and that didn't have uh, an HOA or regulations uh, so you could park it on that property. Yeah, Alex is right. That's a great point. Well, my understanding of 3D printed homes is that uh, you can make them look any way you want. Yeah, go on Zillow. There, there, there's, there's some on there and they look pretty cool. Right. Uh, but even if they, you know, maybe looking cool is the concern for some neighbors, but I, if, if you can make a, if, if, if location, location, location is the most important thing, then just 3D print a house that looks like all the other houses in the neighborhood. It's just a more efficient way of using materials on the interior to, uh, um, to, to make it more inexpensive for the person who buys it. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, and if you go on Zillow, you know, there's a couple on there for three hundred thousand in the, uh, you know, the, somewhere in New York or something like that. They look, you know, they look nice. But yeah, you're right. They they look similar. Um, there's there's million dollar houses in Whitefish that are made out of hay bales, and uh, from the outside they don't look any different than a conventionally built house, but they're made out of straw. So you know, just like the three little pigs. So it, it's really just a function of you know what your neighbors think, and if you can appease their uh, uh, their, their, their ideas of beauty and aesthetics, uh, you might be able to pull it off and live in a cheaper house than you might otherwise. When it comes to food preparation, there are a variety of methods that can be used. Two popular methods are dehydrating and freeze and freeze drying. Uh, first off, what's the difference and which do you prefer? Yeah, do you want to start with this one since you're the only one who really dehydrates and freeze dries food right now? <laughs> sure. I don't um, know. The um, um, uh, dehydrating essentially uses heat to remove all of the moisture in food. Uh, a freeze dryer uses the sublimation process where essentially that it freezes food to a level that is so cold and then by using vacuums, it reduces the atmospheric pressure in the freeze dryer so that the water, when heated back up, goes right from uh, ice into, into vapor, uh, thus taking out all of the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the moisture. I prefer food that is freeze dried for several reasons. One, it's easier to rehydrate freeze dried food. Secondly, is you lose almost nothing in nutrition over 
freeze dry, uh, over uh, uh, by freeze drying, whereas you lose a significant amount of the nutrients if you freeze uh, if you dehydrate it. Of the three food preservation methods that we have, which are canning, dehydrating, or freeze uh, freeze drying, freeze drying maintains the highest nutrient value 20 years from now compared to the other two. Uh, you see a lot of erosion in, in the nutrition. If you like chewy foods like beef jerky uh, or fruit leather, then dehydrating the way is the way to go. But if you like crunchy things like uh, chips or, uh, or crunchy food, uh, uh, fruit uh, candies, then freeze drying is the way to go. The problem with freeze drying is, is the freeze dryer is extremely expensive. You're going to spend somewhere between $2,500 and $4,000 for a freeze dryer. And you can get a, a, a food dehydrator on eBay for about 60 bucks. You can dehydrate food in your oven, can't you? You can. At low heat for a long time? You can. Yeah, well, some, some ovens don't go low enough. Mm. That some of them have a break off where you can only go as low as 180 degrees. And a lot of dehydrating, you need to get down to 100, 105 degrees. So check with, I, check with your manufacturers before you take your advice on, uh, on dehydrating in your oven. I, I've only ever dehydrated food, usually before, uh, before backpacking trips. But um, I like the taste of dehydrated fruit a lot better than I like the taste of freeze-dried fruit. Um, if I was going to do it for, um, if I was going to do both, I would probably dehydrate for shorter term and freeze-dry for longer term. If I wanted to store food for my, uh, my six months to 12 months of, uh, of food rations in my house, I'd probably opt for freeze-drying. And then uh, if I wanted to snack on it the following day or following week, I'd probably dehydrate. Astronaut ice cream. That's that's <laughs> good. Exactly. So that'll be my point that the, the only advantage uh, freeze drying has is you, you get astronaut ice cream. You can also go to Costco. I, I saw it you know, for a thousand dollars. You can buy like a year supply of freeze dried food at Costco. So, yeah, I put uh, I put some ice cream in the oven the other day and it didn't dehydrate. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Tasted real bad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my, my only real experience has either been Beth has um, dehydrated some fruit. Otherwise, growing up right across the street from NASA, there's lots of freeze-dried ice cream and fruits and all that other stuff that they sell at all the gift stores. Uh, so I had a lot of that as a kid. <laughs> so it was pretty tasty. Ice cream sandwiches were not bad. I will say if, if you're worried about the, you know, uh, like an apocalypse coming where, you know, the economy collapses and uh, you're wondering if you should buy gold, I, I would maybe think about buying a, a freeze dryer because if you can store up food in your house, that's going to last you 25 years. I mean, that, that'd probably be more useful than having gold bullion sitting around. That or maybe seeds and a plow and some yeah. uh, oxen. Yeah, but if you do a good <laughs> job. It's going to get that bad. Yeah, I mean, if you do a good job uh, freeze drying food, though, I mean, you can save up like five years worth of food and make it till uh, some some economy emerges from the ashes, and then you can uh, you can start working. But um, well, they they have I've I've seen some of those um, the ones they sell at like Walmart or Amazon. Some of them they say like have like a twenty year shelf life. Uh, the ones with like dairy in it and whatnot are only like five years or something freeze dried, but. Uh, yeah, it might be a little more useful than shiny, shiny metal coins. Are they, uh, can you run them off of a solar panel? I imagine they take up a lot of uh, electricity. So as long as Flathead Electric is still pumping electricity into yeah. the grid, then uh, yeah, freeze dry would be pretty handy. Well, when the apocalypse comes, you will have wanted your freeze drying done before right. Flathead Electric goes away. Uh, there is one caveat to, uh, to freeze drying is that uh, if you take a look at this uh, this water bottle, you can freeze. I'm sorry, you can dehydrate about five zucchinis and fit them inside this container. But if you freeze dry it, you're only going to get maybe three quarters of one zucchini in a container this large. Freeze drying, they retain the same shape and size that they were before you uh, freeze dry them. Freeze dry them. However, with dehydrating, stuff gets really, really, really small and compact. You can store a lot more food in smaller space with dehydrating than you can with freeze drying. All right, well, let's move on to the lightning round where I'm going to try and ask you guys five or five questions in one minute. Last time we did 30 seconds and we completely uh, failed at that. 
So this time I'm going to try and ask you five questions. We'll put one minute on the clock and see if we get through it. All right. So first question is that if you came up with a cryptocurrency, what would you name it? I call mine gold coin because I want to cast as wide of net as possible to uh, potential investors. I call it Wildcat to see who got the reference. I call it eCoin because it works on elect electronics. I call it useless coin. So that way when you buy it, you're <laughs> like, hey, I bought, a, I bought a bunch of useless coin uh, <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> All right, uh, special purpose acquisition companies is basically, uh, it's, it's kind of like a mutual fund that has no companies in it. You put your money in it and the fund manager will pick a private company and, uh, and invest all the money in it. Do, do you like them or do you not like them? My, my enthusiasms for SPACs have, have dwindled over the past. I still like them. Uh, I think they're a great menu to have on the, uh, um, great item to have on the menu, but um, they're not the filet mignon anymore, I suppose. Good option, probably wouldn't invest in one myself. Nice tool to have in the toolbox, but uh, I'm not out buying SPACs. I was in the Ackman SPAC, and well, I'll just, just leave it there. That was a complete disappointment. <laughs> All right, which would you rather hold shares of, Coke or Pepsi? Pepsi. Um, I like that they own uh, Frito-Lay and, and uh, Quaker products, Quaker brands. Me, probably Coca-Cola. I'm um, just looking at it as an investment, lower debt, better dividend. Coca-Cola for the same reasons Alex presented. Yeah, ditto. I looked at both of them. Coke's got better dividends and a little bit less debt, so. Uh, James Bond movie is coming out this weekend. Uh, what is it called? Uh, no Time to Die. Yeah, No Time to Die. And apparently this is gonna be, uh, Jeez, I'm blanking on this. Oh yeah, Daniel Craig's last time playing Bond. Uh, Joe, are you gonna go see it this weekend? No. <laughs> Drew? No, I'm not this weekend, but the odds of me seeing it before I die are, are pretty good. I thought it was already out, but uh, I, I don't have any plans to see it in theaters. Yeah, same. I've never been a big Bond fan. Uh, Daniel Craig's been all right, but um, you know, I've been, I guess if I had to choose, I'd go with Mission Impossible over Bond. So. All right, well, we've probably got in a minute there, but uh, all right, well, that was it for episode 18, and we'll see you next week.